The world's trash used to be China's treasure. It was the largest importer of recyclable waste. But when it called time out in 2017, it left many without any kind of plan B. Millions of tons of plastic waste and other waste is piling up. So if it doesn't go to China, where does it go? Hello, a warm welcome to the program roundtable with me, David Foster. China's ban has forced some to adapt and take responsibility for their own rubbish. So are we moving to a new era of recycling or is the rubbish a mounting problem? China has long been the answer to the world's rubbish problems. Since the 1980s, it's been the biggest importer of foreign scrap. But the dumping ground the world has come to rely on has ended after the Chinese government introduced an international waste ban. How has it changed the way we manage global trash? For decades, the rubbish we generated wasn't our problem. The vast majority of it, from the likes of the US, UK, EU and Japan, was sent to China for recycling. The trade boosted China's economy and provided materials for its manufacturing industry, but it also created health and environmental problems, particularly in areas dealing in hazardous electronic waste. Banning 24 of the most harmful types of trash helped mitigate that problem, so China was free to deal with its own rubbish. <laughs> But has the ban actually been good for the environment on a global scale? China's enormous capacity to process recycled materials helped limit the amount of waste in international landfills. And by using recycled materials, it reduced the demand for raw resources. China's trash ban was welcomed by environmentalists. Not only would it make China cleaner, it would also force countries to re-evaluate the way they dispose of their rubbish. But the sudden cutoff has left some struggling to find alternatives. We have a lot of surplus that's building up in, in our warehouses, at waste handling facilities, and we're you know, frantically trying to find new markets to, um, to handle these materials. A recent study estimates over 110 million metric tons of plastic could pile up by 2030. Countries in Southeast Asia are beginning to pick up the shortfall, but they lack the facilities to cope with demand. The region is one of the most polluted in the world and already struggles with its own handling of waste. Does the solution lie closer to home? Shipping rubbish abroad adds to greenhouse gas emissions. A national rather than global approach may also motivate countries to clean up their act. For years, almost half of the world's waste was sent to China. It was an arrangement the world came to rely on. But now that that's ended, what are the alternatives? Is there enough time to find a solution to this mounting problem? Yeah, today we are rubbish, and not what we're going to be saying, but what we're talking about, of course, that is. And joining us via Skype from Washington uh, in D.C., District of Columbia, we'll have Robin Wheeler, president of the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries from Brussels, Arno Brunet, director general of the Bureau of International Recycling. And with me in the studio, Charlotte Middlehurst, deputy editor of China Dialogue, which is a forum for environmental issues, among others, and Libby Peake senior policy advisor at Green Alliance. Warm welcome, each and every one of you. Uh, Charlotte, let me start with you. From China's perspective and from the rest of the world's perspective, it used to be a sort of win-win. I mean, we would get rid of our rubbish and they would make money out of using it. So what's changed? Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite right. Um, what's changed is that China has a pollution crisis on its hands. Um, and it is saying no to dealing with the, the waste of Western countries. So. The waste ban is really part of a much broader set of environmental and econ economic reforms that you're seeing in China. Um, it's also a way of 
China improving its public image of saying to the rest of the world, we're not going to take your trash anymore, quite literally. <laughs> so it's a green badge of honour, if you like, because up until recently, China hasn't given a, a, a hoot about pollution, has it? China, China in the last sort of six to eight years has been moving to implement a set of policies which are minimising waste at home and improving air pollution, soil pollution, uh, water pollution. Um, it, what do you reckon? That's because it's got a conscience at last or, or because it simply sees this as something it needs to do to, to keep in with the international community and the way things are moving? I think, I think it's pragmatism more than moral So it's the, the latter rather than the, than the consciousness. OK, um, Robin, let me come <coughs> to you first of all. Um, it would seem to me that this is a, a boost to the rest of the world's recycling efforts because it's got to go somewhere and it, uh, one hopes it's got to be recycled. But you don't like this. Well, we certainly support the efforts of the Chinese government to improve its environment. There's a critical need to do that, and we support those efforts. And we've worked actually uh, cooperatively with the Chinese to share best practices in order to recycle responsibly. I think one of the things we have to do is reframe how we're discussing this. We're not talking about rubbish. We're not talking about dumping um, rubbish into China. We're talking about the movement of commodities. These are products that manufacturers need. We support the effort of the part of the Chinese to ban trash that was moving into China. There were people that were using the label of scrap to move trash. Um, and so we're very supportive of the movement to stop that. Uh, but it is a global um, industry. It, it's demand-driven. Scrap moves where the need is, where manufacturers need the material. And that will certainly continue. We're certainly in a transition right now. But out of the U.S., scrap moves to 150 different countries worldwide. Yeah, so, so my question initially was, um, it's a boon, is it not, for the rest of the world's uh, scrap recyclers that China's no longer doing it, that um, the pie is being divided out around the rest of the world? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it a boon um, in that, um, again, it is uh, scrap moves where there's a demand for the material. And that China has demanded the material. They've consumed out of the U.S. almost 40 percent of what we are generating for export. And there aren't necessarily ready markets for some of that material. So it's going to take some time for the market to sort itself out. Although we are seeing more investment in the U.S., certainly in the EU and, and in other regions. So recycling will increase um, in other countries as well. But it is a global need. I mean, the problem doesn't go away, does it? It just moves somewhere else. Well, the problem could go away if we started handling things in the correct way. I think a lot of the reliance on China has resulted from the fact that for years we haven't put the effort into making sure that we're designing and collecting things in such a way that they can be economically recycled in the West. So we've been reliant on China. Um, and I think there have been warning signs for years that China was going to say, actually, this isn't good enough. We don't want this stuff. So well, why do you think China doesn't want it? Because it wants to say, look, we are making this effort and it's, it's a green environmental effort or simply for, for other uh, more selfish reasons. Well, I think the main problem is that the, the material that they're getting was far too contaminated. So in 2013, they launched something that was called Green Fence, in which they started checking waste containers a lot more thoroughly to see whether or not there was contamination, because they were getting a lot of contamination in with the recyclable materials. And that really should have been a wake-up call. At that point, we should have determined how, that we, how we could reform the system so that it was producing the right quality material. So let, let's turn this around. It, it wasn't so much, or it was in part, that people were sending them stuff that they ought not to send them. It's just that the Chinese were very lax in checking that what they were getting wasn't the right material. I think that the, I mean, the problem stems from the fact that they were sending stuff that wasn't recyclable. And the, Ch and so the Chinese, until that point, hadn't bothered checking. Well, so they needed raw material to, to produce things, yeah. and it wasn't something that they could source from their own country at the time. Um, and it's cheaper to sort things and to recycle things in China. So I think for a time they were willing to accept contamination, but I think it got to the stage where they were saying, no, that's too much and we can't handle this anymore. We need clear, we need clean material if we're going to be recycling here. And, and before we go to Arno, um, if China 
continues along this anti-pollution path, or let's say the slightly less polluted path at the moment. There are those who say that is going to restrict Chinese economic growth, and that in turn will have a knock-on effect to other countries. So people may actually find themselves economically worse off because of what China is trying to do, but um, environmentally perhaps better off. Is, is that a fair assessment? I think that there's a, a lot of things at play here. So it depends what happens in China, whether or not they're able to source recycled material from other countries, which is happening to some extent, and they're also to some extent using virgin material. So it depends what happens with all of the systems, whether or not we're producing material that's cleaner in the first place, and whether or not China and other countries are able to then recycle it. Thank you. We're going to go to Arno. If China needs these materials and the ones it's producing itself through its own means of recycling are not good enough, where is it going to turn to get them? Well, first of all, the, uh, the Chinese have set up uh, new standards which will change probably uh, the global market. So it's, it's a call for the industry to do better, to process more. So basically what, what China has decided has an impact on the way the recycling industry is going to uh, behave and process the materials uh, around the globe. Um, in other words, what is happening in China is likely to be copy-paste pasted in other countries and other countries may adopt the same standards. And if they do... So over time the recycling industry is going to improve quality not only to meet the Chinese standards but to make sure that the commodities we produce are of the best quality. And is the world far enough advanced in terms of your line of business, which is recycling, um, to take on that challenge? Yeah, the problem is the timeline. Um, what was a shock for the recycling industry was that there was little notice. In other words, uh, China announced its new policies in July last year with an entry into force beginning of this year, 2018. Uh, it takes time for the industry to adapt, to invest into processes, into know-how. So it will take some time, but I'm very confident that the industry will deliver a better quality over time. Charlotte, isn't it rather strange as somebody who's, who studied China, not just involved in Chinese current affairs, but you've, you've looked back at what it's done, that China is being praised by Arno here uh, for setting new standards in terms of recycling in, in dealing with the world's mm -hmm. rubbish. Mm. Actually, I think it's quite appropriate that China is being praised for setting these standards. I think, you know, China is the biggest importer of waste plastics globally, but it's, it's also the biggest producer. So for China to show willing and engage in the global conversation about how production standards can be improved to minimise the amount of plastic we're bringing into the world. Um, I, I think that that's constructive and I think it's positive. I, I think we have to think carefully about how we frame this debate. Like There is a shortfall in China that's resulted from these restrictions coming in in terms of feedstocks that are used by the manufacturing sec sector. But China is able to fill that uh, shortfall in, in, not right now, but in the long run it will be. China is, as it gets richer, it's producing more plastic waste of its own. Um, and a big uh, priority for the Chinese government is to ensure that, that that waste is being processed safely and, um, and according to standards uh, and, at home. And I see Robin nodding in agreement with that. What do you want to add? Um, absolutely. It's, it's a great point. Um, one of the issues within China that has actually driven the changes that are occurring is that there's a need within China to improve the re recycling operations. Although there certainly have been some very state-of-the-art operations, there have also been a lot of operations that were not operating according to global standards. And so the Chinese government has taken significant steps that we support to close down the operations that are not operating responsibly and to drive responsible recycling within uh, the country. And that's something we support and we've shared best practices and look forward to seeing that improvement. Okay, Libby, from, from the green 
standpoint here. We're looking at uh, recycling here. Uh, the choice, if you're not going to recycle, is either to burn, to bury, or find another dump. And this is just going to go out to countries such as Malaysia and Thailand and Indonesia who are going to be quite willing to take it because it's valuable. Well, I think that we've seen that in the first instance, the, those markets that you've mentioned have absorbed some of the slack from China. But in the long run, those countries also aren't going to want low-quality material. And we've already seen some of them start to... Um, impose more inspections and to, to impose restrictions on the stuff that they're accepting. But I think that one thing that's China, that China has done well that people can learn from is take a long-term view and really trying to connect the recycling sector with the manufacturing sector. So rather than just recycling for the sake of recycling, they would be recycling so that they could feed into their manufacturing sector. And if the West and the other countries that have been reliant on China were to adopt a similar sort of stance, then they could get similar benefits of having a steady stream of recycled raw material. I, I don't want to paint you it, it, as somebody in a corner in which you're, everything that you're saying is going to have a negative impact on manufacturers, etc., etc. But two concerns here. Um, one in the UK because of cardboard. There's now a glut of cardboard and nobody knows what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, for instance, the Australian iron ore industry is worried that if China cuts back on its mm. pollution, it's not going to need as much iron ore and that's going to affect that industry. The knock-on effects of this are, are, are considerable. Yeah, so we do have to <clears throat> think about things in a strategic way. So thinking about if we're establishing recycling in the UK for things like cardboard, what is going to happen to the cardboard and how can we establish a system? If we're recycling the waste close to where it arises, who then needs it? So then you do need to actually keep talking to China if they need, if they need cardboard boxes or, or establish markets for the recycling. That's a very important part of the system that's been left out a lot of the time. So here, here I'm going to put you in direct um, link with, with Robin here. Uh, from your green corner to, to Robin, you, you represent the people who deal with, with scrap. If, if you want to talk to each other and, and work out how far you think you're going, that's great. But the question I would say, um, Libby, I would like you to put to her, is, is sort of how far are we down the road of sort of improving everything so that uh, it's more environmentally friendly? Is, is, is that a fair point? Um, I think uh, there's certainly a point that there needs to be a lot more joined up activity between people like Robin who deal with the scrap and the manufacturers and also with government who will then establish the, the system and the framework to allow people to work in a joined up way. And I, I imagine that Robin will probably agree with me on that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. There, as a matter of fact, we've been working for years in partnership with uh, the U.S. manufacturers in order to promote design for recycling, to increase recycled content. There's also a lot of work right now within the U.S. with the U.S. government. The Department of Energy within the U.S., for example, established a $50 million five-year, well, long-term plan for looking at advanced manufacturing using recyclable materials. And it, uh, it includes a consortium of 50 different entities from across academia, manufacturing, recycling, the nonprofit world. So there is a lot of discussion taking place right now. And it's not only within the US, I know it's global as well. And I'm sure Arnaud could talk about that as well. And, and Robin, before I go to Arna, and I didn't mean to put words into your mouth, Libby, but I, it, it's sometimes easier to sort of put people in touch with each other if it comes through the chair. Um, before I go to, to Arno, this is a game changer, is it not, in terms of the way we produce waste? Well, again, I, I want to be clear, it's not waste material. This is a commodity grade material that manufacturers need in order to produce well, their Well, hang on, let, let, me, let me just say at the moment, it's waste when it arrives there. It, 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 perhaps it isn't later on. Um, I would disagree. It's not. Well, you wouldn't throw it away it if it wasn't waste. Uh, right, we're not throwing it away, we're recycling it. Um, <laughs> any product that you throw away it becomes waste. Um, but regardless, yes, this is um, material that is uh, being used by manufacturer, and this will help further um, increase recycling rates. And we're that certainly there is that potential, and we already see increased investment in recycling as a result. Okay, Anna, I am going to use the word waste again because when you consign it to a bin, even if it is recyclable, it, it is a waste product to you. So this is a game changer, is it not, in the way that we think about waste but as, as Robin said it's not waste it's a resource 
And, and we absolutely need to catch that resource and use it over time, transform it, add value to it, and inject it into the manufacturing production. If we don't do that, we won't save CO2 emissions. We won't save the primary resources. So when you say it's a game changer, yes, of course, because it's vital for the planet. Uh, and this is, it's not only a business. Of course, it's a business uh, originally. And, and it's good that it's a business because it triggers the efforts. But over time, it's vital for the planet and for the society that we collect, sort, and reuse all those materials in the, in the best way possible. Just a quick one before we come back to the studio, Arnaud. Are we efficient enough in recycling, or do we produce far too much waste product in turning what I would perhaps call waste, you don't, valuable products, into reusable products? Do we need to think about how much energy is used and bring that level down? Well, we, we know that recycling products, depending on the categories, recycling materials saves a lot of energy. If you recycle aluminum cans, for example, you can save up to 95% of the energy that you would use to produce an original can from, 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 the, from the ore. So we absolutely need to integrate this, and people need to understand this. Um, and that's the, 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 the big thing about recycling. It's good for the planet. Okay. Please, 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 Charlotte. Yeah, I wanted to respond to that. I think it's um, totally right that we acknowledge that scrap is a, is a valuable resource, but we have to remember that it's only valuable if countries have the capacity to turn it into something that can be you know, put back into supply chains and used by, by manufacturers. And when you're looking at countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, where this scrap is being rerouted to, um, you know, they, they don't have, in many cases, the capacity that's required to deal with it, which is why you're seeing, you know, the Vietnamese government withdrawing licenses for importing scrap. You're seeing pushback from the government in Thailand now, similarly. Um, and I think there's a real onus on, you know, Western countries, the big exporters, to support developing countries in Asia to build up their waste disposal capacity here. There are organizations in the UK like Waste Aid who focus on this specifically. You know, we've got to remember that um, the US produces, I think, 2% of the plastic that enters the ocean, according to some studies, you know, and, and over half of it is coming from Asia. And that's because the waste disposal systems in these countries need, need building out and need support. Libby, um, in response to that, I'd like to get, get your thoughts, but I want to then follow up with, we've come a long way in talking about whether you call it waste, whether you call it recyclable material, whether you give it a fancy name, we've come a long way in, in, in dealing with this sort of thing. But, but first of all, your response to it. Well, I think that's absolutely right. There is a real problem with sending waste material, recyclable material abroad to countries that don't have the infrastructure in place to handle it properly. So if you're just looking at plastics in the UK, we export around two thirds of what we collect and we don't actually recycle that much domestically. Um, and I think one of the main reasons for that is because recycling policy in the UK, in the EU, has focused exclusively on targeting recycling as a proportion of the material. It's not been, it's not looked at other stages of the, the flow of materials through the economy. So it's done nothing to change how products are designed so that you can reduce things. It's done nothing to change products so that they're recyclable. And it's also done nothing to ensure that there's a demand in the countries where the waste arises for that material at the end of life. And, and it's done nothing for, um, it's done very little for domestic infrastructure it, to recycle. Is it fair to suggest that um, developed countries are, are lazy in looking for solutions, longer term solutions, because it's far cheaper for them just to move the problem onto somebody else? And that, that is something that we need to change. I, I think that that's an effect of how recycling has been approached. I think that people have now realized, in part thanks to the China ban, that there's a real problem with what's happened and they need to start thinking about other aspects and not just targeting recycling as a proportion of material, but thinking about how products are designed and ensuring that there's more emphasis on developing infrastructure to recycle domestically. And of course it's not just plastic, is it? No, there's a real problem with mixed paper as well. That, that's, uh, that's been quite hard hit by the China ban. Um, and China is 
sort of mixed paper being everything from cardboard to to writing paper to tissue paper etc is, is that, that what it's a um, paper that hasn't been sorted by grade um, and we're seeing that China is imposing they're extending the list of things that they don't want to accept anymore um, so it's certainly not just plastic it's it, there's a problem with all sorts of materials and how they're collected and the quality that we have and if you from the green corner could take one thing that um, you think is beneficial that this debate involving China, the headlines it's produced, has brought up, what would that be? I think it's really highlighted the importance of quality and it, it's focused minds again, hopefully in a way that will actually achieve change this time, that we need to improve the quality of material that gets produced and then make sure that it's of high enough quality to actually recycle. And you think the, the, the willingness is there? I hope so. <laughs> OK. Listen, thank you very much indeed. Libby Charlotte, uh, Robin and Anna, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think it's fascinating that the debate has moved on, that it's not necessarily just about how much rubbish we produce. It's sort of how we can use it, as you say, not as a waste product, you two over there, but as something valuable to be treated as a commodity. Um, I hope you found the programme interesting. I certainly have enjoyed talking to you. Uh, we hope to have your company next time. From me, David Foster, and the team, of course, that made this possible, goodbye for now.